Open your books to the, open your Bibles to the book of James. So James was Jesus' half-brother. Mary had, uh, Mary had four sons. Some of you might have not known that. She had at least two daughters that we know of. If you're looking in your Bibles at uh, Matthew 13, I think it's around verse 55 or 56. Is this not the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? And his brothers, James, Joseph. Now, for those of you who don't know what a Joseph is, uh, Joseph was the way they called the word Joseph. And Simon and Judas. Okay? And that James, the first one listed, is the one I'm talking about. So he wrote this book somewhere in the vicinity of... uh, the year 48 to 62 AD. So from the time of Christ, when we have our new modern day calendar, this is why you often hear things like 2,000 years ago. Well, that's what they're referring to. So he was stoned to death. And so when we go through the book of Acts, somewhere around verse chapter 15, when it talks about the... uh, uh, the council and James and all. So we have that, and we know that that didn't happen until somewhere around 38, 40. So it had to be after that. So the historians, Josephus, um, who uh, cataloged a lot of these kinds of details, that's where you can get some of this information from. So it starts out, chapter 1 starts out, James, a bondservant of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, (laughs) knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, does anybody here lack any wisdom? Well, if you did, let him ask of God, who gives to all who ask liberally and without reproach, and it might be given to him. Does it say might? It says it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like the waves of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he'll receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man. He's unstable in all of his ways. Let the lowly brother glory in his exaltation, but the rich in his humiliation, because as a flower of the field, he'll pass away. For no sooner has the sun risen with the grass, its flowers falls, and its beautiful appearance perishes, so the rich man also will fade away in his pursuits. Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Don't expect the crown of life if you don't love the Lord. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire is conceived... It gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Some people get hooked on it. No, I don't want to start preaching yet. Let me just keep going. Do not be deceived, my brethren. Every good and perfect gift comes down from above, comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. You're in verse 19 for those of you just catching the book. James, verse 19. So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath, for the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflowingness of wickedness and 
and receive the meekness and implanted word which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not just hearers only, or you're deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is just a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man observing his natural face in the mirror. For he observes himself, then he goes away, and immediately he forgets what kind of a man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one be blessed in whatever he does. If anyone among you thinks that he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his own heart, this one's religious is useless. <laughs> There's a lot of useless religions out there, aren't there? Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father of this to visit what? Orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the word. Let's pray. Father God, we bless your name. We love you in the name of Jesus. We praise you. We thank you for your grace, your love, and your mercy. Father, as you have just been so glorified through this worship, I pray, Lord, you will just continue to allow this as we receive your word Graft it to those, engraft it to those who are seeking you. Lord, thank you for your grace, your love, and your mercy. Thank you for your truth. Thank you for the healings that you are performing for us to glorify yourself. In all this we say in Jesus' name, amen? Amen. 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 In my Bible, it says James. No, it doesn't. It's, it's scratched out of the line, and it says the word Dominic. All throughout my Bible, it has my name about, I can't even tell you how many hundreds of times. Because every time God is saying something to me, I want to make sure it's to me. Plus, if anybody ever finds my Bible, you can pretty much look anywhere and bring it back. Because nobody will keep a Bible with, maybe if it had the name Brenda in it, I don't know, but Dominic. So all of you, at some point, take out a pen, put a line through the word James, and write your first name there. Start making your Bible mean God is talking to you. And you might find a little deeper accountability to what you think and say and do when the next time you go back to it and, ooh, Dominic. A bondservant. What is a bondservant? So today in our American world, we have lots of names, but over generations of time, names change of titles. So today you think of the word manager. Say manager. Manager. A manager in Bible time was spelled S-L-A-V-E. Slave. Really? Why could you be a slave and be a manager? And by the way, don't mind me, because I'm probably going to be blamed by stepping on somebody's toes, as every time I come up here I step on somebody's toes. It's not me. If the Holy Spirit catches your heart and convicts you, I am not reading your mail. I'm not putting you out on front street. I'm not throwing you under the bus. I'm just saying what the Lord is just giving me in my heart to say to you, and if it's really speaking to you because you start squirming in your seat, well, maybe that and one behind the back of the head would help. You know, David, he got five stones, remember? Remember? How many did he need to strike Goliath down with? Why did he need five? He had doubt? No. Goliath had four brothers. Most of you don't know that if you don't know how to study and dig and deep and get it. He didn't miss. He just knew there might be the others. So if you're not geared up for what is coming up, then when it comes up, shut up because you weren't ready to be ready to fire up. 
Get it? Got it? Good. But if you're more than a manager, you might be called what? The general manager. Ever heard of that one? The general manager. General manager means you're the boss of other, like you might have several managers all over different areas. And you have a region or something, right? But just because you're the general manager, are you still the owner yet? No. So right now, today, the first thing we're going to cover is, are you the owner or the manager of your life? Are you the owner or the manager of your car? Are you the owner or the manager of your money? Are you the owner or the manager of look down at your shoes? Are those yours? You think they are. When you start acting like the owner, God's hands are off. You start acting like the manager because God owns everything. What does it say in Deuteronomy 8.18? You shall remember the Lord your God because it is he who gives you the power to gain any wealth. Uh, one day when my little girl, Selena, was four years old, I hope one day I'll get to talk her into coming here and singing for us. Papa knew her from a little baby girl too, and Candace, and my daughter Alicia. And you were just little girls in youth church. Those of you who are new, I was the first youth pastor here. So... I didn't just fall off the turnip bus. I fall off a short yellow bus. So, <laughs> and if at any given point I happen to say to you, what was I talking about? You better be paying attention so you can answer me. Because I'm reaching the age where actually I don't forget things. I just realize there's a lot less things I need to care about worrying about so I don't need to remember them. It's so much easier when you get older. Either you're the owner or the manager, and you better make a decision. Because if you own it or you act like you own it, God's hands are off it. Who cares if you paid for it? I just got done telling you Deuteronomy 8.18. So my little girl, Selena's in the back of the car, and she says, Daddy, are we rich? Now, there we are backing out of our driveway in Los Angeles. And I, I thought that was interesting. I, and then the Holy Spirit gave me a wisdom word, and he said, say this. And I said, you know, honey, we are very rich. And you never know, one day we might become wealthy too. So you better make sure you understand the difference between rich and wealth. Rich is a quality of life. Wealth is just stuff. Stuff which Peter told us is all going to burn up in the end anyway. So whatever you're holding on to, that's mine. Once again, the David and Goliath thing. David needed how many? One? But the Bible says that Goliath fell on his what? Face. How do you hit him square between the eyes and he falls on his face? When you get hit between the eyes and boom, you think you go backwards? I'm convinced that the moment that thing hit, God hit him in the back of the head. That was the end of it. And God is so much more stronger. And he went down. Thanks for the water. <clears throat> wow. So how did you become a bond servant? Well, every 50 years in the year of Jubilee, by the way, this is what Bible college and seminary is like, okay? So anytime I step up here, I'm going to teach you like a bunch of seminary students, like God's Word. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 1.17, I didn't come to baptize. I did not come here to start programs. He said, I came here to preach the gospel and not with eloquent words of wisdom. So I don't care about a popularity contest. So I didn't come here to start programs and I didn't come here to be popular. Paul said, I did not come to baptize. I came to preach the gospel and not with words of wisdom and eloquence, lest I make the cross of Christ of less effect. So whatever fancy hoopla you try throwing into the mix to just help a little, unless it was an anointing God gave you to do, you're forcing it. Now, you can fabricate God's anointing all you want. 
50% of the pastors in the pulpit on any given Sunday aren't even saved. The ones that are, about better than 98% of them, only know half the gospel. And it doesn't matter if they're on TV or not, that's just a matter of budget. You throw enough money at anything, you're going to get somebody to follow you. Who? All the stupid people. Why? Because they're chasing for something, and since you seem to have it all together, we might follow you. The only problem with that is in Luke 6.40, Jesus said any disciple... Any disciple will never, no disciple will be above his master. But when he has been perfectly trained, he'll be like his master. Which means whoever you're learning from, you better pay good attention to who you're hooking up to. Because if you're listening to Reverend I told you so, Pastor I got it right, Doctor I know it all, Bishop don't question me, and all of those guys, all you're going to become is a parrot of that. And you just become another religious prig sooner or later. P-R-I-G. Start looking up words too. You'll learn them. So a spiritual prig is somebody who just thinks they know it all. You can't talk them anywhere because they're not new at this. They've been around. You better take that label off because God will take it off for you. So every 50 years, the year of Jubilee, if I owed you money, you had to forgive me for the debt. If I'm your slave or your manager, you have to cut me loose. You can't keep me. But the fact is, if I got it going on around here so good, and I don't want that to change, well, I'm going to go to the owner, and I'm going to say, I want to become a bond servant. Oh, you do. Yeah, that means my wife, my few kids, my future kids, my future grandkids, everything I own, everything I have, I never want to leave here. You treat me so right, and I don't want to do anything else, so please leave me right here with you. I want to be a bondservant. So the owner takes him. He pins his ear up against the wall. He takes an awl and a hammer right through the ear, and he pierces it, and he puts an earring in it. Now, anytime, anytime this guy walks through town, what do you think people think? Oh, he's got bling? No, oh, that's a bond servant. He sold out to his master, his owner, for the rest of his life. He has fully surrendered his life to the death. If you don't get that way with Jesus, you're just religious. And religion means you take some of God, 90, up to 99%, and you just add as much as 1% or more of your help, and you've got religion. How do you think religions get started? And denominations, how do you think that gets started? Even to this day, being non-denominational is a denomination. We're non-denominational. Oh, yeah, here go, you might as well be. Do you realize how many Baptist churches there are? Yeah, a lot. But do you know that there's over 200 denominations of Baptist churches? Individual political denominations. Over 200 of just those guys. And they... <sighs> but the bottom line is if you make the cross of none effect, so what? And you will always make the cross of none effect until you become a bondservant of the Lord Jesus Christ. That means there's a point where you surrender and say, all right, you take over. I give. I give up. I give it all. And whatever you're supposed to turn it into, please do, because I can't wait to see it. Because I'm the one giving it up. Well, the good news is you'll be the first one to see it because you are the one giving it up. So if you can't learn how to become a bond servant for the Lord Jesus Christ, then at some point you need to get to the place where you say, I surrender all. I surrender all. I surrender all to Jesus. I surrender all. You know the song. You're singing it in your head already. I know you are. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to him, my blessed Savior. I surrender all. So the first thing James wants to do is point out right here, I'm writing this letter and I'm a bondservant of my brother. But guess what? 
until Jesus went to the cross, until he rose from the dead, and until such time that he came back and presented himself for 40 days to an accounting of over 500 people that documented. Get it. Jesus, his four brothers and his sisters, they thought he was a wacko. He was an embarrassment. They didn't want to be around him. When he came around, they're like, oh, okay, I got to go shop. I got to go mend the garage or something. They didn't want to be around. He was a nut job, they thought. But until after the resurrection and he appeared to them, then they all believed. And so basically, James became the pastor of the church in Jerusalem and through the scriptures, which today I'm only going to cover James chapter 1. We'll be done around 2, 33 o'clock. What are you laughing at? Never mind. So I'm going to teach the book. I'm going to teach the book of James, but each time I come up next next time it'll be chapter two. You need to read through it multiple times. But the only thing I really want to begin to point out in chapter one right now is simply this: unless you understand that Jesus Christ is the only single one responsible for any blessings you have, now that's whether you believe in Him or not. Haggai 2.8 says, the cattle on all the hills is mine. And I already told you, you can't gain any wealth unless he blesses you to get it. And five times more than any other subject in this whole Bible, God talks about stewardship, if you didn't know that. How you get it, what you do with it when you got it, what's your attitude while you're using it, what's your opinion after it's gone. Every, there is nothing you should ever need to know about how to become a massive success except it's right here in this word. Otherwise, you can become success according to the world. And then I already read you that passage. And that rich guy, he's out of gas. It's like the flowers of the air. He's gone. So there's so much to cover. There's like nine critical sermons that could be taught in just chapter one alone. But this first piece you need to understand is if you don't make Jesus Christ Lord of your life. Oh, you could pick him as Savior. A lot of people do. Because unfortunately, most of the guys in the pulpit, they're not, they don't even know about half the gospel. They know how you get saved. The struggle they have is how do you live out that salvation? So subconsciously, unawares, or even consciously, unawares, they're using all kinds of psychological wisdom of the world. And then they try to wrap it up with some good religious paper, spiritual newspaper or, or wrapping paper. You wrap it up with Jesus, and I guess that makes it okay. So you could say, yes, Jesus, you died on the cross. Your blood was the payment for my sins, and you did that in my place. And if all I do is believe in you, I'm saved. Yay, yes. Okay, there's your justification. You're saved. What about your sanctification? That's the other half. Because if you don't know how to live that, if you're not the guy who was next to Jesus and he said, this day you'll be with me in paradise, <laughs> you better be on your deathbed because guess what? If you wake up tomorrow or a few hours from now and all you said is, yes, I accept Jesus as my Savior, you're still going to pretend you're the owner of everything too. And you're going to wind up just practicing being religious whenever you get around religious people, spiritual people, and really born-again Christians that Jesus is their Lord. Half the time you won't know how to act, but as long as you come into a place where you're preaching to the choir, you can't get in trouble. It's easy to act like you're a Christian when you're in church. I want to see you at 4.55 in the afternoon on I-4 in downtown trying to get through, and I'm in the car next to you, and I want to be watching you on camera because then I'm going to see whether or not Jesus is your Lord or not. Boy, listen to all you, you, you swarming in your seats. 
If it weren't for the grace of God, if it weren't for the grace G, R, hey, G, R, what? A, C, what? E, the grace of God. What does that stand for? Listen, I don't teach anything that you better not have a pen in your hand. God's riches at Christ's expense. G-R-A-C-E. God's riches at Christ's expense. You want to know what grace means? Grace means it costs Jesus everything for you to get anything. Period. Otherwise, it's just all you, ain't it? It's all about you. 